Welcome friends to another r slash nuclear revenge video. Today we've got a great story of revenge against scam callers. But first, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below so you never miss any of my daily videos. That said, our first story of the day is high school bullies revenge. I have no shame in admitting that my friends and I were very mockable by today's standards. It was a friend group of four guys, including me. We were never the type to speak to other girls at school, probably because we would get rejected immediately. I was as skinny as a toothpick, whereas one of my friends was pretty big. He was also kind of short, around 5 foot 5, which didn't help his appearance too much. The rest were pretty average, no one stood out for their beauty, that's for sure. Our breaks consisted of playing D&D in the high school cafeteria. We'd been friends since freshman year, and had gained our reputation for being the weird kids. And although we didn't have the best high school experience possible, it sure as heck was enough for me. My friend group was my safe place, my home, and I really would have done anything for those guys. My sophomore year was rather uneventful, which was actually a big relief considering what was about to come. We went unnoticed most of the time, no one wanted to be seen with the weird kids at school. However, that meant that we also weren't getting picked on, at least not in a way that really bothered us. Then came junior year, when coming back a lot of people had glow ups, as it's normal in the teenage years for hormones to act up. For our friend group, that wasn't the case, just more facial hair and not in a good way. It honestly didn't bother me, as I didn't have fragile self esteem. However, it seems as though our fellow schoolmates didn't feel the same way. A lot of people seem to think that just because they were better looking now, they were somehow better than everyone else or at least anyone with less popularity than them, the first major incident. It was a normal day and my friends and I were heading out of school. We live relatively close to each other so we usually walk home together, except for one of my friends, who would live like 4 miles away from school so he'd always bike to school and back. When he went towards the spot for the bikes, we realized that both of the wheels were completely deflated. On the bike was also a sticky note which said, Lose the weight big guy. It was kind of shocking at first for all of us as we had done nothing wrong to anyone, but we quickly realized that he was just another victim of high school shenanigans. He had to call his mom because he refused to walk home, which is fair considering it's 4 miles and 80 degree heat while also moving his bike. You could even say dragging since the wheels didn't serve their purpose anymore. He just told his mom about the wheels, claiming that it must have been some sort of accident or something because he felt embarrassed to tell her about the note. On the next day, our bike friend, for storytelling purposes we'll call him Ed now, seemed pretty down. One of the wheels on his bike was working fine after just pumping some air in it, but he couldn't rescue the other one. He came to school with his mom on that day. Since he never told his mom about what had actually happened, she assumed that it was his fault and therefore had to buy the new tire with his own money. And although it wasn't a very expensive repair, he was pretty down about having to use his savings for such an incident. During the next few days, Ed remained vigilant as he came to school with his bike. He was worried that they'd try and do the same thing to his brand new tire. One day, while we ate lunch in the school cafeteria, a random guy came up to our table and sat down. It was a short interaction, but it was quite the interaction. First, he asked us what we were playing and seemed genuinely interested in it. It's not common for people at school to come up to us and show interest in our nerdy games. While we were explaining what our current quest was, remember this is D&D we're playing, he interrupted the explanation by standing up and spilling over a food tray all over the board. From a distance, I heard a group of people burst into laughter. He apologized, although it was clear he didn't mean his apology, and then whispered something into Ed's ear. As this guy sat back down with his friends, they laughed even more. We asked Ed what he'd just said, and apparently he said, and I quote, You should have taken my advice. As I looked back at the group of guys who were laughing, among them I saw none other than the principal's son, which made everything even worse, because now there wasn't much we could do about it. And even if there was, at this point, it wasn't worth being put in the spotlight for this group of guys to continue to mess with us. Everything remained calm for the next couple of weeks, however it became very clear that we were not off the hook quite yet. Whenever these guys would walk by us, they would do anything to mess with us. They gave us all weird nicknames which in my opinion were neither hurtful, clever or funny. 
For example, from what I remember, the first nickname they gave me was Paper. Ed's was Muskrat. Either just by yelling at us in the halls or just putting us through some really awkward situations, they'd always find a way to make us the joke for everyone around us to laugh at. It never quite got into my head, as I feel I'd seen way worse online. Ed wasn't taking the pressure as well though, and neither was another guy in my group. We emphasized how important it was not to react to their attacks, as they always tend to pick on the person who will give a better reaction. As the school year was coming to an end, these guys backed out and stopped messing with us as much. Even if they didn't, at this point our friend group had gotten pretty used to them and just weren't bothered by their childish insults. They did get caught in the act twice by some teachers and got yelled at, so as to not risk detention or anything worse, their attacks were less and less harmful every time. Ed's bike tire surprisingly survived for the whole school year since he replaced it after their first attack, and his morale had gotten a lot better. They clearly did get into his head though, because he was clearly keen on changing his appearance. He focused on working out and eating healthy all through the summer, and even dragged us along that path because we all came to the conclusion that we were pretty lame. It was a positive change for all of us and we motivated each other while doing so, which was honestly really good. At the beginning of our senior year, we all looked a lot better. It was funny to feel everyone looking at our walk through the halls after our summer of working out. We weren't jacked or anything, but we were definitely looking better and seemed a lot more confident, especially Ed. He had lost like 25 pounds during this time. In the usual walks through the halls, they actually nicknamed him Turbo Nerd, which was at least better than Muskrat. We all had stopped working out by this point, but Ed kept going. And although his motivation was higher than ever right before school started, seeing all of these familiar faces still took a toll on him. He once mentioned that even after working on himself and changing his appearance, people still seemed to pick on him for whatever reason. We started talking to girls more frequently, which was actually quite impressive given our record of being terrible with the female gender. Ed had a particularly tough experience though. The second major incident Ed had stated that he had been talking to some girl from another school for a decent amount of time, maybe like a month or two. We were all very happy for him, but we were also confused about why we had never heard of or seen this mystery girl before. Apparently he kept it a secret for quite some time because he felt embarrassed to tell us, just in case he got rejected. He was telling us this information just now because he was finally planning to meet up with this girl. It was technically a date too. We knew we had to prepare for the occasion, so we helped him out. He got a new haircut and everything. Ed was looking clean. And just as an extra, he got her some flowers and chocolates as a gift. I know, very cliche. They'd planned to meet up at this girl's house. We kept in touch with him to see how the date went. However, it didn't go particularly as planned. From what he told us, upon arrival, someone he was not expecting greeted him at the door. None other than the principal of the school himself. He was obviously very confused and just assumed he got the wrong address. We all met up at my place afterward to discuss what had happened. He texted her asking if he got the right address, but she never replied back. Nothing was adding up here, as it was very weird that he ended up going to the principal's house out of all possible places. A few days later, a video started going around of Ed at the principal's house. It was the ring doorbell feed of him showing up at the house all dressed up with roses and chocolates. And although he is my friend, it was a very funny thing to see. However, there were also texts that got leaked between this girl and Ed. Specifically, the one where he asked her if that was the right address or not. Turns out, this had been an insanely elaborate plan all along. The principal's son and all of his friends had created this fake account and were playing with Ed all along. And just to make it all that much more embarrassing, posting these videos of Ed showing up at the house and the text that went along with it just made Ed seem extremely gullible. Almost everyone at school eventually found out about it and heck began for Ed once again. It was enough of a shock for him to find out that the girl he'd been talking with for the past months didn't even exist, but getting reminded of it every single day by most people at school clearly didn't make things any better. He had once again become the people's laughing stock. We tried cheering him up, but I honestly don't know how I would have handled the situation if it happened to me. I never went into depth into who the principal's son was, but I feel like now's a good time to do so. His name was David. I actually used to get along with David when I was in middle school because we shared some classes together. 
But ever since he got to high school, he's just been a gigantic jerk. I'd say, whenever you think of a principal son, two images come to mind. Either a massive nerd who has to excel in all of their classes in order to keep their parents' reputation, or the guy who, due to their parents' position, decides to do whatever he wants as he knows there will most likely not be any sort of repercussions due to their actions. David was the latter. His dad was a really scary man, which would make you think that he's just as strict with David back at home. However, he's actually gotten away with basically everything up to this point. And if you decide to speak out about it, he'll just ignore you. After the first incident happened a year before, Ed actually tried talking to the school counselor about it, but that was also pointless. That made the whole situation a lot worse, as it was something he had no control over, still got clowned for it, and now there was nothing he could do to get back at David. In the middle of the school year, Ed suddenly stopped going to school. It was like an entire week where we couldn't see or even contact him at all. He never mentioned anything about it either, it just happened out of nowhere. We were very worried about his whereabouts, so we decided to visit his house one day. It seemed as though no one was there. We eventually got a response from his mom saying that he was okay for now. It turns out there was a lot more going on in Ed's head than we would have expected. He attempted to end everything but was unsuccessful, and had been at the doctor for the last week and a half as he had taken lots of his mom's antidepressant pills. We all felt sort of guilty for it. Although he never openly stated how bad the comments at school were for him, it was clear to all of us that he wasn't doing great. Word eventually spread at school, which was definitely not what Ed would have wanted, and as his friends, we took the insults for him during this time, which just proved how cruel some people can really be. David started calling us the Suicide Squad and we were all now on the same page. This was not going to remain this way forever. Ed remained to be absent for a solid month. We were visiting him pretty frequently and doing as much as we could for him. One day, as we looked back at our high school years, we realized how much better it could have been if we didn't have this load of extra pressure on us, constantly having to worry about having someone on our backs. What made it even worse is that we knew we had done nothing to stop it other than just ignoring them. We wanted revenge, or at least have some sort of relief after these years of bullying. We wanted revenge for what they did to Ed. Now, how would we get our revenge, you may ask? We all agreed that the person who we felt was most responsible for all this was certainly David. Not only did he cause the whole fake girl scenario for Ed, but he was obviously the only reason why the school wouldn't do anything to help us out, or at least punish him somehow. That's why we decided our revenge would be against him. We knew where he lived, we just needed to find a way to strike. One of the guys in the group plays paintball on a regular basis, so we had an idea. We didn't want him to know who was doing this, we just wanted him to suffer a little bit. So we decided to wait until the end of the school year to act. I'm sure there were more people he would have been suspicious of other than us considering he wasn't a good person, and especially at school, but we knew that we wanted to come out of this clean. Another one of the guys was able to provide our transport to David's house where we could pull off a full-on paintball shootout. Caution to the wind, we didn't care about him getting hit in the face or anything. And so that's exactly what ended up happening. After checking out what David was usually up to for a few days, we figured out an approximate time in which he would be getting home. We had to wait around the corner so as to not raise any suspicion. Once we saw him pull into his driveway, we ran in with the markers and got him perfectly. We wore masks for obvious reasons, but that probably made him feel even more scared. He begged for us to stop, but we kept shooting for a good 10-15 to 15 seconds. Keep in mind, that is 4 guys constantly shooting paintballs from a very close distance. 10 seconds may not sound like much, but it's actually a lot. Before running away, we left a sticky note in his car which said, Next time we'll be lead. We thought it was a nice touch. We weren't actually planning on doing such a thing, but that would obviously terrify him, as he wouldn't know where this threat was coming from. This was never about teaching him a lesson, we just wanted our revenge, and boy did we get one. As if it wasn't already a terrifying situation to go through for anyone, it turns out one of us might have hit him in the eye, or maybe some paint splashed into it, but news was around a few weeks later telling everybody that he'd gone blind in one eye. 
Not just that, but a few months after, we heard the news that David and his parents were actually moving somewhere else due to the threat that they had on their hands. After all those years, David finally suffered just like we had, and I sure as heck hope he never causes something like what he did to Ed ever again. I'm not the only one that thinks that that outcome is pretty crazy, right? I don't think you can put any kind of justifiable label on losing an eye. If somebody is so awful to another person to drive them to the brink of ending everything, can you possibly look at that person and say it's karma that they lost an eye afterwards? That it's literally an eye for an eye? Or is this just two awful things on both ends? I'd like to know what you guys think in the comments down below. That said, our final story of the day is scam callers steal from my grandma, so we shut them down. I find the story I'm about to tell, and I'm sure many people could relate to my experience, but I like to believe that I managed to do what many people can't, and that is payback. I've always found it fascinating how the evolution of humanity as a whole, including all of its inventions, has also forced unlawful ways to earn money to evolve with it. 50 years ago, who could have imagined that you could eventually be at risk of getting robbed of your life savings? All through a computer and a phone. A rather unexpected threat that's more real than ever nowadays. Most people are well aware of these scammers, scattered all around the world, taking advantage of unexpecting victims. In 2021, almost 70 million Americans were victims of some type of over-the-phone scam. Even I've had to deal with these in the past where I get some pretty realistic emails regarding some sort of purchase I hadn't made. They typically include a phone number, which once you call, you're typically greeted by someone with an unexpected accent. Their scripts usually go along the lines of, Hi, this is Very American Name from Big Company, Microsoft, Amazon. How may I help you? Younger generations are obviously more up to date with these trends and have learned how to avoid them entirely. However, that's not who these scammers are trying to reach. They usually target older people who don't have as much knowledge of technology and all of its power. Now with that said, here's my story. This all went down around a year ago in 2021. One day, I received a call from my grandma regarding some issue she was having with her computer. I study software engineering, so whenever there's a tech-related issue in the family, they instinctively call me to fix it. She mentioned that she was browsing online and suddenly received a pop-up stating her computer had been infected with a virus and she needed to call a certain phone number to fix it. I asked for a picture of the pop-up since it didn't ring a bell of what the issue could actually be. Whenever a virus gets into your computer, it's not like it's going to give you a welcome pop-up or something. Hey, your computer has a terrible virus, haha, you better save all your files quickly or call this number or else said virus will destroy your computer. Yeah, that's definitely not how it works. After seeing the image, although it looks like a real pop-up, it very clearly wasn't. I told her this, however, she was still unsure and afraid of her computer being taken over by this virus. I decided to go over to her place just to show her and reassure her that there was nothing wrong with her computer. I also took the time to change some of her account passwords and make them a little safer. Scammers usually get potential victims information through data leaks, so it's better to be safe than sorry. I also decluttered some of her emails just to prevent her from falling into one of these trap emails on accident. I explained to her the idea of how these tech scammers typically work as well because if you're well informed of this risk, you'll obviously be more likely to avoid it. A few months after this incident, I had a family gathering at my grandma's house. We were all gathered together when our grandma told us about something odd that had happened to her in the last few days. Apparently, she had received some sort of voice message from the IRS. This was an automated message stating that the person they were calling, in this case my grandma, was getting sued by the IRS. When she said this, she wasn't surprised about the nature of the call itself, doubting if this was actually the IRS, but instead she was surprised about the amount of money she had to pay to take care of the situation. We obviously all asked for more information about this. Her story made zero sense to all of us, as she was being accused of tax evasion. She's obviously an elderly person and retired more than 10 years ago. She hadn't been paying taxes for all these years as her only income is what she receives from the government, Social Security. What to us was confusing, to her made sense. She didn't imagine such a thing could happen, where someone pretends to be the IRS in order to obtain some dirty money. 
Therefore, she did exactly as they told her. She had gone to the bank to withdraw a total amount of $2,000. After that, she was told to go to a nearby Target and spend this money on varied gift cards. During this whole process, they emphasized to her how important it was for her to not hang up the call or speak to anyone else about it. I was pissed when I heard this. I quickly found out that the IRS normally contacts people via letter for the first time. They don't send emails, text messages, or call taxpayers. This to me was the nail that shut the coffin. My grandma had been scammed, and they had taken a decent amount of what was left from her life savings just like that. Our whole family was shocked. And although it seemed like a stupid mistake to make in the eyes of most of us, we couldn't really blame her for being scared, as she wasn't aware that the scam was even a thing. That didn't change the fact that she had been blatantly robbed though, and I wasn't going to let that slip. At the time, I was going through my 7th semester of college and was very much interested in cybersecurity and white hat hacking. I underestimated how complex these scam groups actually were, and so I thought it would be easy to penetrate them and somehow get the money back. After further investigation, I realized this certainly wasn't a one-man job. At this stage of college, many of the people I knew were looking for projects to include in their portfolios, so I took that as an opportunity and got a team of four people, including myself. I'd explain the issue at hand, however, I didn't have a plan on what we would do to get the money back. In the end, I simply wanted to get revenge on these scammers and so we brainstormed. It wouldn't be as simple as calling the bank and telling them what had happened since the money had been withdrawn in cash, and they requested these gift cards as a form of payment in order to avoid any tracing. You can also try calling some numbers to report these incidents, but that's likely not going to change anything, so we took the hard route. We first had to get an idea of the experience of getting a scam call. We entered a few dodgy websites until we finally struck a suspicious message. Similar to the one my grandma had first received, we had a pop-up claiming a sort of virus. It also included a phone number that you had to call to fix it. We tried calling, and just like expected, the person who greets us has a pretty heavy accent, yet claims to be a Microsoft employee. I wanted to stall this process and get as much information as possible and see if I would have an insight into how these people usually attack their victims. They started to get mad at me as I played dumb and just kept on doing things that they weren't asking for. The call eventually hung up and I could only think there's no in between for these calls and their victims. Most of these calls are so blatant and obviously a scam that it really makes you wonder how people even fall for it at all. This led me to the conclusion that you either realize it's a scam right away or you don't at all. Part of our research process was also watching loads of YouTube videos on the subject. There's now a whole genre on YouTube dedicated to getting payback on these scammers. I took a lot of inspiration from these videos on how we would proceed and what our end goal was sort of like. With these videos, I found out that there's not just a bunch of call centers dedicated to scamming, but rather massive operations in cities all across India. I was curious to see what would happen if I called the phone number which had scammed my grandma. As expected, they followed a similar script and tried to get a similar amount of money from me. However, as I kept on stalling them and asking pointless questions, they might have caught on to the fact that I was only baiting them, so they eventually hung up. One thing I also didn't expect to happen was that once you call one of these scam centers, your phone number is leaked and you're marked as a potential victim. I received probably over six calls of a similar nature over the past week after the first call. Now that we had done our initial research and had managed to get some information on how these centers operate, it was time to step up our game. We could waste their time all we wanted, but that definitely wasn't going to have an impact on them. Our first major move was getting into the same IRS scammer system. This was huge for us. On our first attempt, using a voice changer and a virtual box, we managed to view the computer of the person who was helping us and the documents inside of it. We managed to save a lot of them on a hard drive for further investigation. We could have gone ahead and deleted all of them, but that felt too easy. I'm sure it would anger them, but it also would have put them on guard for a possible attack. Steady wins the race. After inspecting them, we mainly found logs of the people they had called and ones that they were planning on calling. 
We weren't sure how often they typically update these, but we felt it was only right to try and call some of these people and alarm them of this scam. We also might have struck gold, as we found some more scripts from the same call center. They don't just pretend to be one company per call center, but instead, they take the image of lots of other companies such as Norton Antivirus, Amazon, and most notably Microsoft. We knew it was way better for us to attack these tech-related callers rather than the IRS one that we'd already tried since it was a hassle to get them to connect to our computer. Some more weeks and lots and lots of calls later, we had built a strong portfolio with information about where and how they operate, and it was time to begin the next step. We would now use all of this information and scare the living crap out of these guys. It had gotten to a point where accessing their security cameras wasn't hard at all. We also managed to track down a few of this organization's offices. Knowing such things, we were able to play the role of a ghost within their office. On one day, we literally dedicated our time to just annoying the workers here. Since we had the personal information on a lot of these people, we were able to have absolute power whenever we were on a call with them. We would tell them what they're wearing and the address of their workplace. For some of them, we even managed to get their home addresses. In one of these calls, I actually recognized a familiar voice, it being none other than the original IRS scam caller. I knew I would have to target him specifically later on. Seeing the reactions of fear in these people was priceless. They eventually shut down operations for the day as the continuous reports from workers scared them of a possible raid. We were scared we might lose them as they tend to migrate offices whenever stuff like this happens just to be safe. Therefore, it was time to wrap this whole thing up. We got in contact with the local police department and we provided all the information we'd acquired up to that point, the building address and even the floor on which they operated. We had audio recordings of calls in which they illicitly request this money with the video footage to go along with it. The entire process was way harder than we expected, mainly because of the fact that these call centers have turned into an actual mafia, sort of like a drug cartel. They tend to actually pay police departments and government officials in order to avoid confrontation with the law. Since our latest ghost attack was still so fresh, it was also a good idea to stall for some time until they felt safe again. After some further investigation from the police department over in India, and many, many weeks later, we were notified that the raid was successful. Turns out this was a smaller operation with three offices spread around the city of Kolkata. All three of them were intercepted and eventually shut down. My friends and I were happy with our effort. We'd actually learned a lot and learned a bunch of very cool skills, which could be useful in the future. We definitely got lucky with a lot of things though. We infiltrated their system out of pure luck from our attempt with the IRS caller. This was a big part of the process which actually allowed us to get information on them. We also got lucky that we ran into a small operation. There's some of these businesses with hundreds and hundreds of offices all over the country. They're extremely wealthy and can buy cops and lawyers and go unnoticed for as long as they please. Cooperation with the local police was also a big part, as communication was almost impossible being in different parts of the world with different time zones and different languages. In regards to the guy who literally scammed my grandma, he never faced any direct consequences for his actions and I never got the money back, so I decided to play with him for a while since I still had his information. I wrote a Python script that sends messages to his phone every day. It's around 12 text messages per day. It's fully automated, so it generates a new burner phone number every day, so he can't just block me, and sends pretty awful and threatening texts. I also give him a call once in a while just to make sure he hasn't changed his phone number. I've been doing this for about three months now, and I think it's absolutely hilarious. I mean, honestly, taking down this call center is a fabulous revenge, even if it wasn't like ending up in people involved with it getting held really accountable for their actions. I think this is kind of referencing a lot of like what Jim Browning does, which he does some awesome YouTube content on taking down scam callers and exposing them. And hey, at the worst, annoy the crap out of somebody who ruthlessly stole so much from your grandma and probably lots of other unsuspecting people. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another absolutely crazy revenge story, 
click on that left video, or if you missed my latest video, check out the one on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.